say to my soul, be like a bird to your mountain. For behold, the wicked men of bow, they have fitted their arrow to the string, to shoot in the dark and the upright in heart. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Lord in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes see, his eyelids test the children of men. And the Lord tests the righteous. Yes. But his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. And if rain holds on the wicked, fire and sulfur and a scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. And the Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds. The upright shall be called his face. Amen. You can all take a seat. There's quite a few people here that we haven't seen for a while and then there's visitors as well but we have Daniel <laughs> we're still working on this it's Daniel and your family's here uh, we met Daniel a couple of years ago is that right a year maybe a so ago and then your family all came over good to see you all good to see you uh-huh welcome and, uh, give her a welcome. and uh, but today as well, we have a lady who contacted me by email, and her name's Anna, am I right? From Mexico. And Mexico, it's pronounced Mexico in Mexico. So, and, what, and you're gonna bring your little baby? You can do, you can come, because they um, asked for, uh, just for prayer, and I was thinking about the text that we read when we were recently going through Matthew, you remember Matthew chapter uh, 19 or 18, well it's actually chapter 19, and if you recall, Matthew chapter 19 verse 13 says, then little children were brought to him that he might put his hands on them and pray, but the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, Let the little children come to me, and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and departed there. So, obviously, what's your name, Anna? And the name here? Samantha. Samantha. So, Anna is bringing into the house of the Lord and her baby Samantha to the Lord. And we're just going to pray as a church. We're going to ask you to join us and uh, stand up together stretch forth your hands and just pray the blessing of god upon the mother and the child and especially for samantha i old is your uh, baby i'm guessing a few months at most five weeks oh, yeah so let's, let's pray lord we just pray your blessing and, and anointing uh, of the spirit of god upon this child from the very earliest of time she came into the house of the lord doesn't even know where she is necessarily but the mother does and and we thank you lord god that in here lord god is a safe place for children and we do pray your blessing upon her lord god her strength and her character her wisdom from the lord all of those things will be hers from the very start set her apart for your purposes and your plans we don't know the purposes and the plans you have for her but we do know lord god that um that in some way god is sovereign over all things and over all people and everything happens lord god we therefore pray lord god for you to direct her steps direct her first steps direct her words direct everything about her lord god for your honor and glory in jesus name Amen. yeah one, and we just pray for Anna as well, Lord. Yes. You can show that your baby to the camera if you want. And yeah, we just pray, Lord God, for, for Anna, that Father God, that you would help her to be a good mother and uh, 
a godly mother for her children, Lord God. And Lord God, that you would help her in all that she has to go through, living in this country, Lord God, whatever she's doing, Lord God, that you would supply her needs, Lord God, and meet every need, uh, help her, strengthen her, encourage her, and make her a witness wherever she is, Lord God, for your honor and glory. And uh, help her, Lord God, to feel at home in this family of God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Um, so just a couple of quick announcements. What, what we'll do is uh, give you an opportunity to give on to the Lord this morning as we give of our offerings, gifts, time, whatever you call it. Okay, let's give to the Lord in Jesus' name. Okay. Um, Gina is not here today, so I will be taking care of the children. All right, so. I'll just quickly say hello to our online viewers. Eddie, um, not Eddie. Um, <laughs> uh, yes. Um, but um, Larry and Muriel and um, Amy and Thomas and Kellogg. And uh, it's been great the last couple of days getting an opportunity to go out on the streets and do some evangelism. Uh, it's just Larry's been there giving out John's Gospels. I've been doing stuff and it's actually available. The last one was recorded by Victor there and it's on YouTube already. Okay, if you want to see how we do evangelism on the streets of Killarney. Um, another announcement is that this Wednesday night, our regular Bible study that was up in the former buildings, which is uh, the Rock Road. Okay. Just continue that in a moment. Father God, we ask your blessing upon everyone here who is giving God and to meet every need according to your riches and glory. But we set aside these gifts, Lord God, for your service, Lord God, for the upkeep of this church, for the work of the ministry, for all that's being done, for your honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. So we've been trying to locate another location for our Bible study because uh, they're, they're converting those, uh, those, the place where we had church before is being converted into two apartments, and the ones beside them are also going to be converted into apartments. To show you there's a great demand, and if anyone knows of any houses, come and tell us secretly, because there's lots of people asking about where can we find a house. But, you know, if we hear anything and there's Christians here who would look for houses, we can maybe help you out. But, um, We've been asking around about getting a place to meet, and it so happens, of course, we asked the school, and they said, yeah, you can meet here. So we're going to be here, and it's going to be in the staff room, okay, which is a big conference table, chairs all around, and everyone can see each other, and I like that type of thing, where you can just be across the table, sharing and talking. We had a great meeting last Wednesday night, didn't we? Uh, with the other, um, there are some believers who meet up above there in the Holy Cross, and we met with them just on a special event, and um, it was great to be able to have fellowship with, and so many of you came along in support. It's good to see that. And just to hear from my uh, friend Marcus from Germany who gave the, the word there. And that was really good. So um, anyway, that's our plans. If you want to join us on a Wednesday night at the Bible study, 7.30, we continue this Wednesday with Revelation chapter 11. And um, it's been very interesting, some intense arguments. But as you can imagine, the book of Revelation is such a broad book and there's so many different views on it. No one can claim that they have the right interpretation. And if they do, they will be challenged to see if it holds up under scrutiny. Okay. <laughs> uh, the tester, <laughs> examiner, Eddie. <laughs> All right, so is there anything else? Yeah, and we also want to have a church uh, business meeting uh, in the next few weeks. I'm just waiting for a, a suitable time. Hopefully by the end of this month, we'll be able to meet one night during the week. If what we'll have to find out is what suits people, it'll probably be a Wednesday or a Thursday night. Maybe Thursday's better, so as to avoid clashing with the Wednesday night. But if you come and say, I'd like to be in a business meeting, it's only to discuss our church finances, where we're going, things like events that are coming up, 
and eldership. We all want to talk about those sorts of things. And if you could tell me, I'd like to be there, but this is the day I can't. We we'll try to accommodate as most people as possible, but we'll probably be on the, one of those two nights before the end of this month, okay? So you can come and see us afterwards. Amen. So let's pray. Father God, we pray that your word would go forth today. And um, thank you for all the word that goes forth, Lord God, both in the streets and also from the pulpits and for all the people who are watching and who are listening and we just don't know who's watching and listening. And um, pray for those who are here today, Lord God, that your word will find a resting place in the hearts of each one here and that the spirit of the Lord will minister to us through this message this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. So just on that, I was talking to a bunch of young people the other day on Friday. They were so touched by the message. And, they, and I mentioned, we do have a YouTube channel. And they said, well, we're going to subscribe to that. And I did notice that the subscriptions did go up. So that's a, that's a good thing. They only are 87. So <laughs> it wasn't hard to figure out that two had been added to it. But um, it was great. And you know what? I think. I also know that people are praying for us. I know we ask for prayer, but this doesn't happen, and I don't claim this happens all the time, but there were a couple of times. Have you ever experienced that, where you might have been talking to somebody, and all I can describe it is like some sense, like a tingling maybe, a sense of God's presence somehow, that just, why now? I feel something just is happening while I'm talking to this person. Maybe it's because of the prayers. Maybe it's the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Whatever it is, it could be excitement, you know, but it's, it was just something to know that um, something's happening with these people. And I hope and I believe for harvest. Amen. Amen. Well, today. Amen. Well, today we're going to be looking at Psalm 23. And you should have no problem following it. And we do say at the very start, Eddie did a great job <laughs> on Psalm 23. And you're never going to have the same message from Psalm 23 by, you know, everyone's going to say something different about it, okay? 23 people can get up and give Psalm 23, 23 different ways, and it's all going to be different. So we just have to bring our different perspectives to it, okay? And hopefully uh, you will benefit from this, this morning. So let's sort of turn to Psalm 23, and you'll notice there's a little title there which says, The Lord, the Shepherd of His People. And then below, below that title, there's another little subtitle which says, A Psalm of David. And I'm going to come back to that later on. But first of all, let's read the verses 1 to 3. It says, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And you know, this psalm is so well known, so well recognized. Even unbelievers, they, they're pretty much familiar with it, wouldn't you say? And it's great to be able to hear that psalm read in different languages. I learned it, by the way, in Romanian once. And it's good to be able to just quote some different languages because when you're talking to people, they can say, wow, I know that one. But it is great to hear the same idea portrayed by the different people who have that. Has anyone memorized Psalm 23? Anyone here? Surely you know it, at least the first verse, and you may not get it exactly in the right order, but you kind of know, the Lord is my shepherd, Domino este pastoro mau, which is the Romanian version. I don't know what it's like in other languages, but it's, it's the same idea, the Lord is my shepherd. And David, of course, we heard a great big uh, explanation about how he was a shepherd. It's wonderful news. And it is true that David did serve as a shepherd boy. If you turn in your Bible to, I'm going to give you two verses, which are very important. First Samuel 16, verse 11. Now, it may be on the screen behind me, so I'll get out of the way. It says, then Samuel said to Jesse, are all your sons here? 
And he said, there remains yet the youngest, but behold, he's keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and get him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. That's just telling you that David was an actual shepherd boy. I don't know what age he was shepherding up until, but he was shepherding at least for some while. So he knew about shepherding and all the principles that were involved in looking after sheep. But there's another scripture, which is 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 2, which says, In times past, when Saul was king, over it, us. It was you who led us out and brought in Israel. And the Lord said to you, you shall be shepherd of my people Israel, and you shall be prince over Israel. So the idea behind shepherding is not just looking after sheep, but the leaders of Israel were called shepherds. The kings, those who ruled them were also known as shepherds. And David was going to be not only a shepherd of sheep, but a shepherd over People and he would become king. So he, he's saying this, when you read Psalm 23, verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd, you don't have to necessarily think like I'm a sheep. In, this, in one sense, that's true. But also, he's the shepherd, the king, and the ruler over me. So that's a very important thing, because he's saying, I'm, I'm under his lordship, even though I am king, because by this time, maybe he was king over Israel. But at the same time, he's saying, although I am the king and I am the shepherd of the people, I am also under one who is the chief shepherd, right? The shepherd himself. And the same with pastors of churches. We are shepherds of people, but also we have a chief shepherd who is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Amen? So in the sense of that, saying the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now, if you think of it in the, on the behalf of a shepherd and sheep, you could see how the sheep would be trusting in and looking to the shepherd to guide them and help them and to look after them in every single way. But as a natural person looking to the Lord, we can also say, I look to him, my king, my Lord, and because of that, I shall never be in want. And I remember uh, as a person who was not a Christian reading this, because I'd learned it just like anybody else, and heard these words. I had read the words of Psalm 23 as a teenager, not a Christian. And I thought, that doesn't even make sense. The Lord is my shepherd and I don't want him. That's how I read it. The Lord is my shepherd, I don't want him. And I didn't understand that that's not what was being said at all. It was that because the Lord is shepherding me, looking after me, I do not want anything. I do not lack anything. He provides for me in every sense of the word. Amen. So he meet, meets my needs. And it goes on to say so in the next two verses. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He le leads me beside the still waters. Well, green pastures for a sheep would simply be a place where you can be well fed, places where you can roam and eat and have all you want. There's plenty there. And it's a safe place, a place of green pastures, not brown pastures, not bits missing, all patches. It's all, it's, Lush, you know, and that's the whole idea. God is providing for us as a shepherd looking after sheep. He's looking after us, meeting every need. And lushness, I mean, that's what it speaks of. But he also leads us beside this, and it's the leading of the Spirit. Have you ever heard someone say, where God guides, he provides. Where he directs, he protects. You know, and it's very good that, you know, God is leading you all the way uh, as a Christian, you're being led by the Spirit of God, and he leads me beside the still waters. I think um, it was said recently that there's, there were plenty of wild rivers where you could, a sheep could fall in and get swept away, but the shepherd's leading to safe places where there are pools of water, uh, gentle streams where they can easily just get their, their water. And um, it reminded me also of um, some friends of mine up in Bangor who had a house by the seaside and their neighbor bought a sign and put up on their wall outside their house, still waters. But because my friends were Christians, they thought, well, who I do those people? They put up their own sign saying, beside still waters. <laughs> But that, that's because they were saying we're Christians. That's where he leads and guides us beside these still waters. And it does something to us, as he says here. He leads me beside still waters. 
he restores my soul. And I don't want to get into a whole theological um, discussion on what is the soul, whether we are a spirit, soul, and body, or whether we are a material and any material part. The basic idea is the soul could be the mind, the inner man, or anything to do with our life, really. And so the idea is that there's something that happens as you walk with the Lord. He does something to you. How many can say, I have been restored? I mean, my life was a mess, but he has restored not just my inner man, but he's restored my mind. Some people, you, you, if you go back to what they were like before, they said, you don't know, I, I was crazy. My mind, my inner man, everything was in a mess, but he had restored me. You know, refreshes, uh, reinvigorates me with his life. And that's probably what he's saying here, the refreshing of the of the of the Lord that comes. In fact, I believe if you've got the NIV, it actually says he refreshes my soul, okay? Or the, e the ESV says he renews my strength. So the whole idea is here I was wandering around, but he comes, he brings me to those places and I am refreshed. How many of you can say, yes, since I've met the Lord or since I've become a believer, I have been refreshed. But it's not just, oh yeah, and that was 25 years ago. How many of you could say, and he still leads me, he still directs me, he still looks after me, and I'm still being led by the Spirit, and I'm still receiving refreshing, rejuvenation, strength. You know, when people look at us as Christians, you ought to be able to see that there's something that you have that they don't have, and they say, I want what you've got. I want that, okay? Because no matter where we go, we know that we have the strength of the Lord. And what's it say there? He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Now, different translations may say it slightly different. In other words, it might say this, he leads me on the right paths. Not just on the paths of righteousness, but on the right paths. Well, first of all, he does lead us to righteousness. Before you're a Christian, you're not righteous before God, but when he, he brings you to himself, he draws you to himself, he justifies you, what happens? You, you're made righteous in God's sight. I was trying to get that across to people on the streets yesterday, how that he can make us righteous in his sight with right standing, but he also leads us in the right paths, okay? He'll guide you through your whole life, keeping you on the path, and why does he do it? Well, it is for this simple purpose. Last part of verse 3 says, for his name's sake. Praise the Lord that he will be glorified. That's the whole idea, that he said, I'm doing all this so that your life will be glorifying to me. I'm going to keep you on that path. You know, how many of you believe in the keeping power of God? He can keep you from wandering away off the wrong paths. How many, even as a believer, said, I did wander off a few times. Yeah, have you? And he said, I'm going to bring you back. I'm going to keep bringing you back into line and put you on the path. For I want to be glorified in and through your life. And I, I will be glorified for my name's sake. I'm doing it. It's not for your personal benefit, but you do get benefits from it. But it is for ultimately for his name's sake. Okay. Now, one of the ways he's going to lead us is through verse 4. And verse 4 stands on its own. It says, yeah, yeah. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Well, he's not, he's not denying the fact that every one of us faces difficulties. We may have to face death. Unless Jesus Christ returns, we will all have to face it. Not just our own, but the, those of other people. You know, it's been said, I think it was Ray Comfort says, make sure you attend other people's funerals or they won't attend yours. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but we have to go through, some people don't like to face that stuff, but facing that, he says, yeah, I've got to go through it. Yeah, though I walk through the valley. And there, sometimes that shadow is looming large. I don't like the look of it, doesn't look great. It's not something you want to go through, is it? But 
you're going to have to go through some things, but you're not going through it alone. That's the best thing about it. Though I walk through the valley. It doesn't say though I crawl through the valley. Well, I had to run around the valley and I ran as fast as I could through the valley. <laughs> I had to get through it as fast as possible. I walk through the valley. I'm not camping out there. I know someone going to the Black Valley today. <laughs> Uh, there's not much coverage there if you're looking for help, okay, but, but it was said by Winston Churchill, or Sir Winston Churchill, he says, if you're going through hell, keep going, right? Don't stop. You've got to keep going. You will make it through to the other side. Listen to this. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Fear can really trip people up and cause you to stumble and, and freeze you in your tracks, just like a deer before headlights, or a rabbit before the headlights. You know, can stop you in your tracks, but you've got to know this, I'm going through. I'm not stopping, I'm not letting fear get a hold of me. And why? Why do I fear no evil? Why? Because you're with me. I, 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 I was, funnily enough, I found an old hard drive and it had all, some old sermons on it from maybe 10, 12 years ago. And I listened to my own preaching. And I thought, oh, glory. <laughs> <laughs> but there were some points I picked up. And I said this thing. I said, has God ever been in trouble? And I knew it was a trick question because I said, has God ever been in trouble? Has God ever been in bad situations? And people go, no. I said, oh, yes, he has. Because we read in Psalm 46, verse 1, for example, God is a very present help in trouble. And in Psalm 91, verse 15, it says, I'll be with you in trouble. So he's with us in the middle of all those things. You're not on your own. You don't say, oh, God, where are you? We heard it last time. Psalm 23, verse 1, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, we're not forsaken. We can go through this valley knowing that the Lord is with us. You're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Okay, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Well, I didn't understand this, but I understand a little bit of it, that a rod is used to beat off the predators and the staff is used to pick up. It's usually also called a crook, a shepherd with a crook. A crook to pick up the sheep or to point it or direct it, you know, in the right direction. These are the things that the, the shepherd carries, these two uh, tools. I think, wasn't it the, uh, Joseph in, the, in, that, in that patterns of evidence thing? He had these two things in his hands like that, something to look into. But, um, but also, it says that these things he uses to guide me and protect me, uh, to comfort me. What's it say there? Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So he's constantly doing this, leading you and directing you on the right path by using these rod and staff. And um, by the way, I, I looked up the word comfort because sometimes we don't understand what it means. Sometimes the idea of comfort means fuzzy and cozy in people's minds. But comfort Come forte. What is your forte? What is what do you what do you have strength in? And in the, there's a thing called the bio tapestry. Am I pronouncing it correctly? Um, where it depicts a battle, and Bishop Otto is it Otto or Odo? Um, Bishop Odo. He has a mace in his hand, and he's whacking the horses, the cavalry horses, with this a mace, pointed starship thing, he's whacking a horse. And the inscription of the tapestry says, Bishop Odo comforts his troops. Comforting with mace? Well, the idea is he's trying to encourage them to go forward. Keep going, because victory is assured. But he had to do that, you know, to give, to tell them of the strength that they have, to encourage them in what they actually have. We have strength that comes from the Lord. Amen. Now, that's not to say that for, for the believer, yes, we can surely say we can go through all these different kinds of things because the Lord's with us. 
That's not true of the unsaved person. The, the believer or the unbeliever doesn't have that same kind of comfort. In fact, um, Hebrews chapter 2, uh, this may not be in the right order that I originally planned, but Hebrews chapter 2, have you got it on there? Am I in the way? Am I slightly in the way? Move on a bit. Yeah, so Hebrews chapter 2 and verses... Um, verses 14 to 15, it speaks about people saying, inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. But the other, the person who's not a believer has a fear of death, absolutely scared of what is there. Um, and God obviously wants to assure us that we have salvation and there's no fear of judgment and those sort of things. But for the unsaved person, that's not the case. And also, another text is Hebrews chapter 10, verses 26 to 27. It does say this, for if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, even after you've heard the gospel being preached, perhaps, there is there, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, which will devour the adversaries. I mean, that's a thing that I wouldn't want to be having to face that. But the unsaved person ought to have fear of God and of the fear of death and fear of the judgment that is to come. But for the believer, thank God that has been taken away from us. Amen. Okay, let's go back to uh, Psalm 23. We'll just finish with verses 5 and 6. Okay. And we read, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Well, when he talks about preparing a table, I don't know if he's talking about sheep at this point. Well, I can't imagine the, the sheep jumping up at the table, but I can see him in some of his experiences in life. You know, Eastern hospitality would mean that if you were on the run from your enemies, say you were running around and said, they're chasing after me, and you came to the house of a total stranger, perhaps a tent somewhere or a house, they would take you in and they would treat you like they were your, you're their guest. They would, even if the enemy came hunting you down, they could only stand on the outside and they couldn't come in. They, this, your, your host would protect you from them. And in the meantime, he would even put on a meal for you. Isn't that great? So you could have your meal. You could be sitting there thinking, I'm enjoying hmm, this slap up meal with my enemy standing around on the outside. But that's the idea, you know, that we have enemies. Don't be ever under the illusion that we don't have enemies. We have enemies as Christians. They're, we're surrounded by them. But whilst we're surrounded, at the same time, we are feasting. We come to feast of the things of the Lord, don't we? And there's a lot that we could have. And the Bible says that we have enemies. Uh, 1 Peter 5, verses 8 to 9 talks about we have an enemy uh, uh, who goes around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, whom resists steadfast in the field. And Ephesians 6 talks about the, 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 our warfare is against uh, principalities and powers. We have this, plus even in the flesh, there are people who would like to attack us on a constant basis. But thank God, you can do all you want, but you know what? Meanwhile, I'm enjoying my feast, okay? I'm enjoying a feast. You, you don't know what we're feasting on here. It's great stuff. Okay, now he does say here that you prepare a table and or maybe in the presence of my enemies, my, you anoint my head with oil. Now, the sheep would understand that, of course, because shepherds would take some oil, maybe some olive oil, and they would wipe the little faces, you know, their little faces, 
run their eyes, and their ears, and their noses, and uh, rub away all the little maggots or insects or parasites that are buzzing, or flies that are buzzing around, and it refreshes the sheep. Okay, is that what David's talking about? He could have that in mind, but he could also be talking about the time that he was anointed as king. Because in the Old Testament, there was an anointing for the prophet, the priest, and the king, and each of them had oil poured upon them to dedicate them for God's service, to be anointed as priest, as prophet, or king. And they usually didn't cross over into other people's offices. No, king, you're not supposed to be doing that. That's the job of the priest. Don't be doing that. Keep to your lane, okay? But David was a king. And he knew that he was anointed. And even though he was anointed as king, there were enemies who were against him. And they even chased him away at one point, but he had to fight for his place. So he probably is talking about the fact that you've anointed my head with oil. And you know what? In the Pentecostal or charismatic circles, there's quite a lot of talk of the anointing, isn't there? You know, you can buy books and tapes. You could have in the past, at least. You can buy books, tapes, video series on how to have the anointing how you can increase the anointing in your life. People talk about anointed preachers. Come and hear the world's most anointed preachers. Um, whatever that's supposed to be. And I've heard of some, oh, he's really anointed. I that preacher, oh, he's really anointed. I saw the sweat dripping off him. I mean, he's working himself up. And so that was him anointed. But what is the anointing? Every Christian has received an anointing. We read in 1 John chapter 2, verses 27 to 28. Let me just go there real quick. Just in case you think, where can I get that anointing? Uh, do I have to go to, I used to go to conferences all the time just to get to where someone would have the anointing, the power of God that they would, they would rub off onto me if I could just be around that anointed man of God, uh, woman of God. So 1 John chapter, what did I say? Okay, it says here, but the anointing which you have received from him abides in you. And you do not need that anyone teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true, and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. So in that sense, the, there is an anointing of the Holy Spirit upon us and in us, and it's working in every believer. Okay, so thank God for that. You have an anointing. And the Holy Spirit will help you, teach you, lead you, and guide you all your Christian walk. Now, then he says, so you anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. Now, I suppose some people could see that and say, my cup runs over, that's my oil cup. I don't think he's talking about a cup of oil here that runs over. But if he's talking about a table, I mean, I'm sitting there as king, maybe at a table, my cup is running over. Whatever's in that cup, whether it be water, but more likely wine, okay, it's overflowing. And that is a great thing because you know what? As believers, we need to live in the overflow, don't we? I mean, it sounds very Pentecostal, very charismatic, but the reality is we need to be living in the overflow. Where there's an overflow, not just, well, how much have you got in your cup? Nearly drained. There's a dribble at the bottom. Yeah, have you ever been at a party or a wedding or something like that and you're going, People trying to, you know, where, where can I get, you know, a refill? <laughs> but what about if your cup was overflowing? And if, does it not speak of the abundance that we have in Christ? We have such an abundance. Our cup, our lives, everything about us needs to be living in an overflow. And I was reminded of the fact um, that in the New Testament, we have so much more blessing. If, the, if this is David under the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant, with you know, counting his blessings, how much more do we have in the New? Turn over to Ephesians chapter 1, and you will just read a few verses there from verses 3 to 8. Lovely verses. Okay, it says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us 
with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. In verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. This is a blessing. We ought to really acknowledge this. Okay? The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Um, having made known to us the mystery as well, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. If you read the NIV or verse um, verse eight, where we read in the in the uh, New King James says, which he made to abound toward us, the NIV says, which he lavished upon us. I like that. Oh. It's been lavished upon us. God is not holding back. He has given us so much in abundance in this Christian life. Amen? So I think it's a wonderful thing that if David could say that under the Old Testament times, uh, how much more have we got in the New Testament under the New Covenant? Okay, so we read there, um, you, um, my cup runs over, okay? And lastly, verse six says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Well, how sure are you? Are you sure that goodness, which is the Old Testament word for the goodness of God is tov, and then mercy is the word chesed, which is loving kindness. So really he's saying God's goodness and loving kindness are behind me all the way. If I get pushed back by my enemies, my backs, they can only push me so far until I bump into my old friends. Goodness, goodness and mercy. <laughs> right? I mean, you want to push me back? You want to push me back? And every one of us here should say to your, say to your neighbor, I think I'm being followed. <laughs> Who's following you? You think someone's following you? Oh, I know someone's following me. Goodness and mercy. Follow me. And actually, you know what I was trying to do, find out a bit about that. Literally, what happens is the shepherd has sometimes sheep dogs, and they are used to help direct the sheep. If I was a shepherd, I would and I and I had dogs, I would call them goodness and mercy. I would say, What? Goodness and mercy. And you you go you you get after those sheep and you hop, you just steer them direct them because it's always about us being brought back onto the right path. Amen. So surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I just think that that's God. God's working in your life. He's working in so many different ways to bring you along this path that will be secure all the way. But he doesn't finish there. And remember, this is the Old Testament. And yet David says these words, all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. How does he know that? How does he know that? How does he know that he's going to dwell in the house of the Lord? What if he was to slip away? What if he was to backslide? What if he was to fall short and feel and give up the Christian life? Or not the Christian life for him, but the life. What if? Well, he says, no, I totally confident that I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now the house of the Lord could be referring to the temple in God's presence, all of these types of things. But I know that I will dwell in the house. I want to be. How, when do you want, you want to be in church? I want to be there every Sunday. I want to be with God's people, wherever they might be. I want to be with God and with his people all the days of my life. Okay? But that's Old Testament. How about in the New Testament? It seems to speak about an even greater thing that we can say, surely 
I am held by the power of God. He will keep me and I will persevere in the Christian life, but he will be guiding me the whole way, all the way to the end. Amen. Amen. So that I can say, I am going to be in God's house, not just on, see, David was talking about him to the end of his life. He wasn't even thinking really about eternal life. He just said, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord. What's that all the days of my life? That simply means, oh, I'm an old man. They didn't have much of a thought of the afterlife too much in the Old Testament. There's a hint of it here. But for us, we can say, yeah, not just the days of my life, but even beyond that forever. Because it says, because it says, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's even better. How many of you are going to be there forever? Does that not speak of confidence in the fact that we have a salvation and there are people who will fight tooth and nail for the fact that you can lose your salvation. Well, if they want to spend their time dwelling on that, that's up to them. But I don't want to dwell. I mean, someone asked a well-known television evangelist who will remain nameless, who does have the letters KC uh, on his name, but, uh, and, he, and he, he was asked that question. What do you think about once saved, always saved? And he said, I don't think about it. Because I don't want out. I'm not planning on leaving. You know, and that's a, re that's a good answer, I thought, you know. Because we're not spending all our time thinking about how, how can I lose this. I don't want to lose it. I'm not thinking about losing it. I know and I am confident that I dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen? And you know one thing, just to close on, is this. Uh, John chapter 10, verse 11, and John chapter 10, verse 14, talks about the Lord who is Jesus Christ, is our good shepherd. Shepherd and good shepherd, yeah. So just read that. John chapter 10, verse 11, where Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. And he's really referring to his sheep. He will give his life for his sheep. Amen? And verse 14 says, I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep. And I'm known by my own. So he knows who his sheep are. Do you know him as the shepherd? Is the question. See, I said at the very beginning, did I not? We'll come back to this. That it said a psalm of David. The question is, is it something you can say of yourself? Because when I first read this as a believer, I thought, well, David can say, the Lord is my shepherd. I wonder, can I say it? Can I say? Because a lot of people, they could quote that word for word, couldn't they? They know the psalm, but do they know the shepherd? They can quote it. But if you really thought it through, could I pray this prayer? Could I say, Lord, you are my shepherd? Or are you just saying, he's David's shepherd? Can you say, this is my psalm, because he's my shepherd also? Because if you, you, could, you could literally pray this prayer or make this a prayer every day say Lord you are my shepherd and because of this that and the other this is what I'm doing and that's what we need to bring people to ask the question is I'm going to ask you this morning you have you can answer in your own heart and mind is the Lord your shepherd or are you simply quoting other people make it your own personal prayer amen and call the Lord your shepherd, Jesus Christ, who laid down his life. If you're one of his sheep, he laid down his life for you. Amen? Let's close there. And we thank God. Let's stand. And we thank you, Lord, for shepherding your people, Lord God, guiding us, helping us on the right path, directing us, even from youth, even from the, before we were born. There was the hand of God upon our lives, and we are here today, Lord God, part of your people, Lord God, the sheep of the Lord Jesus Christ, of whom he laid down, for whom he laid down his life. And we thank you, Lord God. I pray you bless each one as we go from this place, Lord God, and especially during this week to come, Lord God, that you would just, may, may it be evident that your hand be upon their lives, Lord God, and my lives as well, Lord God, every one of us that would know the leading of the shepherd in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Well